Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the May gardening checklist video. Uh, I've been doing these uh, every month this year. There's one for January, February, March, and April. If you're interested in going back and taking a look at those, and I'm planning on doing them the rest of the year. Some of it overlaps uh, month to month for sure. I'm in zone 7B in central North Carolina. And uh, those of you who are in zone five or six, the April checklist video may be more appropriate for you. Those of you who are in zones eight or nine, uh, you're probably a little bit ahead of where I'm at uh, at this point. Uh, I cannot cover everything there is to do in May, and uh, it would be helpful if you think of something um, and wonder why I didn't say it in the video. I'm sure, like I say, I'm gonna forget something. You can list it you know, down in the description of this video and people that see this video in the future, it'd be helpful for them. So let's get started. Um, one thing that's going on here, uh, typically right here at the beginning of May is you got a lot of weeds germinating. The soil temperature reaches 60, 65 degrees and lots and lots of weeds germinate at that time. And it's best to stay on top of them as quick as possible. So, you know, using, you know, whatever tools are at your disposal, whatever you do for your, uh, you know, weed control. Um, I like to use a shuffle hoe on my uh, vegetable garden where I've, where I've put things in already. As soon as the soil was turned over and things were planted, almost immediately uh, new weeds started to germinate and they're super easy to get right when they've germinated. So keep that in mind. Um, the next thing on weed control is definitely mulching. If you haven't applied any kind of, done any mulching in your garden beds uh, yet this year, uh, I would do that. Do your weeding first and then do your mulching. Keep in mind, as we get closer to summer, there are lots and lots of shrubs and trees that are sensitive to uh, the heat from the sun. And so the roots, that, those would be things where the roots are super shallow. Clematis is one of those things. Azaleas are actually uh, like that. And they would prefer to have at least a thin coat of mulch uh, on their roots. Don't go crazy. Don't pile mulch up on the plants at all, but do get their roots covered. Uh, and they will definitely thank you for it during the summer. It also uh, conserves uh, water, like I say, reduces weed pressure. And uh, it also, like I say, you know, will keep those roots cooler. Also on those monthly to-do things, if you haven't fertilized your trees and shrubs yet, it's definitely um, you know, t still time to do that. You're not, you're not too late. Um, me being here in 7B, I did mine way back in uh, early March, and I only do one application of fertilizer a year. I usually use an organic shrub and tree fertilizer, whichever one you, know, whichever one you wanna use of your choice. I'll link um, something down below. And uh, just do one application uh, during the spring. I use organic fertilizers because they help improve the soil and uh, they don't push the plant so much. I, I find that I have insect, um, more insect and disease problems when I'm pushing my plants. So I just wanna kind of subtly, uh, you know, give them what they want, but don't overdo it. So let's talk about some things we might wanna to add to the garden uh, during the month of May. I'm going to be adding a drip irrigation system into this new landscape project uh, that I have going on. And as I'm planting up some containers, um, I'm, I'm running the lines through those. And uh, during this uh, spring season, if you follow my videos, I'll show you how I'm gonna be installing drip irrigation throughout the vegetable garden, throughout all the uh, annuals, perennials, containers, shrubs and trees and everything. It's a great month to be planning that. I do have a series of videos on my channel uh, about the parts and pieces. Um, and uh, I think there's a three part video just kind of showing you how to assemble all the basic parts and pieces of a drip irrigation system. This is a great month. Obviously the garden centers and uh, um, box stores are going to have a great selection of plants this time of year and uh, going and doing some shopping right now, but being careful not to buy everything in full flower. I, I, I tend to like to, uh, I like to tell people to go and grab some things that have some flowers on them in the spring and then go back occasionally, you know, every month uh, during the year and find some things that have, will add some color later in the season. Otherwise you end up with a spring flowering garden only. Uh, another thing I've done this year is I'm trying to, uh, this is a new garden back here and I'm trying to invite beneficial insects. I'm trying to invite uh, pollinators, uh, you know, bees and butterflies. I want hummingbirds back here. So I'm looking for plants very specific uh, for those things. I'm adding salvia. I'm adding lots of flowering uh, perennials. Uh, I've added a wildflower uh, space over here. I'm planting some sunflowers for birds for later in the season. And so I'm thinking about those things now because uh, it's during the uh, summer and into fall. You know, I want to uh, invite those uh, invite those beneficials uh, into my yard. Uh, obviously hummingbirds will be coming back in May. And so getting your feeder ready or buying a hummingbird feeder and being ready for that. Typically your, um, your bird houses probably have birds in them right now, have, have, have potentially have babies in them right now when, 
when that first round uh, is, is finished, you might want to go in and clean out your birdhouses and prepare uh, for a second round uh, later in the season. Another thing you'll see me do before the month of May is over, if you're following my uh, weekly update videos on Wednesday, is I'll be adding a compost bin uh, to this new house that I moved into. Uh, if you already have an existing compost bin, it is time to turn it over as it starts to warm up uh, outside. But you'll see how I build that and uh, how I go about adding layers to that uh, during this season. Another thing is just adding uh, bed space and looking around your yard and seeing your shrubs and trees would prefer to not be in your lawn or too close to your lawn. It might be that um, as, your, as some of your shrubs and trees get larger, you may need to concede some of your turf space to them and uh, you know, re-edge a little further into your turf and mulch those spaces. And I think you're, you'll find that your turf is happier uh, and your shrubs and trees are happier not having to compete with one another. One thing I really like to do, and it's very enjoyable uh, during the spring, is walking around and seeing things in my area, at other people's houses, at businesses, on college campuses, wherever I can get out into open space and um, I try to identify the plants that are there. There are plant ID apps that you can add to your phone or you can you know, take a photo or take a clipping off of them and uh, go to your local garden center, see if they can help ID them and uh, add some of those things to your landscape. So I've been super busy planting containers uh, so far this spring. I like to plant my own hanging baskets. I like to plant uh, lots and lots of containers, uh, and I don't have any rules for containers. I, I think that shrubs, trees, perennials, uh, annuals, I don't care what it is. If you think they look good in that container together, go for it. I put up a video recently on, um, uh, con you know, I planted tons and tons of different containers, and I went through each of the plants that are in them. If you're interested in that, um, it's mostly easy to find things that you could find uh, at your garden center or a box store. Uh, but I, I do like uh, to add some containers uh, to my uh, gardening space. And again, I have run drip pipe into my containers so that um, I can add them to my uh, drip irrigation system. So when you're searching for summer flowers, uh, this time of year in the spring, they are available in smaller sizes. And that's typically uh, how I like to purchase them. And when I do them in containers, my spring planted containers, I'm leaving some space between the plants because they're going to grow all season long and it will allow them to fill out. When I do my fall containers, I tend to cram them in because they're not going to do any more growing uh, during the uh, fall season, but definitely in the spring. And I like to start with smaller plants. That way they don't immediately fill the pots up with roots and end up having to water and water and, and be root bound all summer long. Same thing in my vegetable garden. I, I do 50 cell trays, my seedlings uh, inside. If you followed my channel, uh, my vegetable garden uh, is in over here. My lettuce is uh, I've got a few more weeks uh, on the lettuce. I've got peas coming on. Make sure if you have peas that you're picking them. Uh, otherwise, they will stop uh, producing. So that's going to be the same thing as the summer comes on with your tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and uh, beans. If you're not picking them regularly, they will slow down and stop. Of course, on your vegetable plants, things like cucumbers and squash and zucchini and beans can be just direct seeded uh, into the soil. Uh, you, don't you don't really have to start those inside and you don't have to buy them as plants. If you can find them as seed, that's the most economical way to go. Once the soil temperature is around 65 degrees, most all of that stuff will come up. And m for most of us, um, we're probably reaching that point about now. Something to think about on your vegetable garden is not filling it completely full in your initial planting. Uh, if you do that, I've seen many times where people just become overwhelmed with the number of things that are ready all at the same time. It's more than you can eat. It's even more than you can give away sometimes. Uh, it might be best to take half of your garden space and plant your tomatoes and peppers and squash and zucchini and all the things that you want to plant in it and uh, save some of the space and maybe four to six weeks later, come back in and uh, plant an additional, additional crop of those things. And it will extend the amount of time that you have uh, edibles coming out of the garden without uh, <laughs> overwhelming you all at once with them. One other thing you might find this time of year at your garden center or a box store is this is going to be the best selection of fruit plants uh, you're going to see during the year. So uh, your uh, fruit trees, uh, fruiting shrubs like pomegranates and figs and blueberries and raspberries and blackberries, those kinds of things. And then um, things like strawberries and asparagus and rhubarb, all those things are probably going to be uh, pretty available this time of year for you to grab and it's a good time of year to be putting those uh, adding those kinds of things to your garden those perennial fruiting plants uh, that you know will give you reward you every year 
Uh, also, same, another thing that's like that is uh, summer flowering bulbs uh, should be available this time of year uh, to grab and uh, maybe some peonies left uh, that are still um, bare root. Uh, if you've got uh, things like tulips and daffodils uh, in your yard uh, that are just finishing blooming. Mine finished a long time ago, but if you're in zone five or six, they might just be finishing blooming now. You can deadhead the flowers on those. Just take the flowers off, don't cut the foliage back. But we don't want the, um, the plant trying to make seeds. We would like to, for it to just put its energy uh, back in the foliage and back down into the bulb. If you need to divide your bulbs uh, this year, uh, you need to wait until the foliage dies back. And so you might want to mark where they are. So um, in any of those early spring, late winter flowering bulbs that you have, mark where they are if you need to disturb them later. May is also a great month to add an herb garden. If you, if you don't have herbs already in your garden, things like oregano and thyme and rosemary, uh, and then summer annuals uh, like basil, it's definitely time to be uh, planting those. So uh, that's something to consider. I see when I go um, to stores that they still have things like cilantro, but cilantro is a cool season crop and uh, it's pretty much almost done at this point, but there are lots and lots of herbs that you can consider uh, adding. Be super careful with mint. I would only grow mint in a container and keep it away from your other things. Uh, it can become a noxious weed in the garden very, very quickly, very hard to control. So May is definitely the time of year that we're pruning all of the spring flowering shrubs that have already flowered. So if you have things like azaleas that have finished flowering at this point, uh, it is time to prune them if they need to be pruned. You don't have to prune everything, but if they're stretched out and they're in need of some uh, reshaping or even rejuvenating, you can do rejuvenational pruning this time of year. If you've got older established shrubs that have stretched out and are have overgrown the space. This is the time of year that you can take those things down a third or even a half, go after them pretty hard. Uh, this is the time of year to thin out dead branches. Uh, anything that hasn't flowered yet, some, something like big leaf hydrangeas, make sure you're not pruning those things. But if it's something that's already flowered earlier in the spring, uh, get in there, prune them, uh, clean them up, shape them up, get out the old dead branches and that kind of thing. And like I say, said earlier in the video, if you haven't fertilized, definitely fertilize and that will help to rejuvenate them. So the hard pruning I was referring to is definitely on leafy plants. Uh, on your conifers, uh, something like Emerald Arbor Vita, you can go and shape the sides of it uh, lightly. You don't want to go after those things too hard. You don't want to be topping them. But your ground cover junipers, your spreading junipers or low growing conifers, uh, you can prune those things back a little harder if they are well established. Fall blooming perennials like mums and asters, if you have those in your garden, typically mid-May, I'll cut them in half. And then mid-June, I'll cut them in half again. I don't want them to grow all season long. These things don't bloom until September. They'll just grow and grow and grow and they'll end up being floppy if you allow that to happen. So like I say, mid-May, I'll cut them in half. Mid-June, I'll do it again. My summer perennials and annuals, I do deadhead. Uh, things like agapanthus that I have in this yard, um, as, the flower, as the flowers fade, I'll cut them back. Butterfly bushes, I'll deadhead. Salvias, ag um, Veronica, any of those summer flowering things. Because as the, flowers, as the flowers fade, they're trying to make seed and we don't want them to make seed. Uh, we, we want them to continue to produce foliage and flowers the rest of the season. So deadheading those things um, is a good idea. When I first plant summer flowering perennials, uh, as salvia is an example of that, and I've got some Veronica in this yard, uh, I'll initially cut the flowers off of those things that bloom all summer long because I want it to put the energy into the roots uh, getting established and I want it to put uh, energy into new foliage and new flower buds for later in the summer. Once we can get them, um, if they can go two or three weeks in the ground without flowering, they'll get themselves more prepared to be on their own throughout the summer and reward you with flowers. So May is definitely the month for staking things. Uh, so things like uh, tomatoes, uh, vines you might have, uh, all kinds of climbers you have in your yard, dahlias, peonies, uh, all of these things that can get floppy in the landscape. We want to be thinking about getting out there and uh, figuring out how to prevent them from being floppy. As you plant your tomatoes, go ahead and put your cages around them if you're going to use cages. Um, or whatever method you're going to use to stake them during the season. Uh, I like to uh, grow my uh, cucumbers and my, uh, you know, I, I do some pole beans and I put those, um, I, I go ahead and put in place the things that they're going to climb on because sometimes if they ever intertwine with one another, they're very difficult to go back and uh, redo later. And you'll find that with any kind of vine, Confederate jasmine, Carolina jasmine, uh, bignonia. I don't care what type of flowering vine you're planting. If you don't go ahead and stake it, 
uh, initially, it's going to get out of control and you're going to have to cut it way back in order to reestablish control over it later. One thing to keep in mind in the spring is that you will always see chewing insects arrive before the beneficial insects that eat them arrive. And so um, I will always see a little bit of chewing on something here or there. This brand new landscape I have, I'm putting in right here, I definitely have some things being chewed on here and there. I'm not panicking, I'm not panicking at all, okay? I don't worry about it because I know that as long as I'm not spraying and killing off everything, that I, beneficial insects will arrive and they'll help me out. If it's something in my yard though that just continues to get this problem over and over and over again and it's some sort of insect problem, uh, that's usually a plant that I will actually dispose of. I, I just kind of decide that nature has decided it doesn't want it there and I will actually remove it rather than getting into the habit of having to spray something because I know if I have to spray it once, I'm gonna be spraying it forever. Is it that important to me? And I just don't think it is. Uh, also be on the lookout for um, powdery mildew and fungal problems this time of year. We can have a lot of cloudy weather uh, in the late spring and uh, early summer and we can see some years worse than others uh, some fungal problems and you can look for organic solutions for those uh, as you see. S just spotting on the leaves is not that big of a deal unless it gets out of control and something starts defoliating. Don't worry about it all that much. Usually those things can recover. If you do have disease related, if you do have disease problems that causes leaf drop of some kind, go in and clean those leaves out from the bottom of the plant and maybe remulch uh, in that space just to kind of seal that off and you'll see new growth come back on them, especially if you're fertilizing and watering them regularly. So May is definitely the time to be bringing your house plants out and you can do, you can do some pruning on them at the same time. You can definitely pot them up, uh, do not. Um, pot, take a small container, house plant, and pot it into a big giant container. Uh, step it up slowly. Uh, it's really easy to overwater your house plants if you pot them into big giant containers from small containers. Uh, so pot them up into maybe a container that's about two inches larger, add some fresh potting soil, fertilize them, prune them if they need to, and uh, they will definitely appreciate all of that. As we get later in the spring and into early summer, watering becomes a bigger issue. So your lawn uh, is going to, you know, about an inch a week is what's required on most types of lawns. And so whether you have an irrigation system or whether you're irrigating it with, um, you know, with hoses or however you're going about uh, irrigating your turf, if you are irrigating your turf, uh, figure out how long it takes to add about an inch of water maybe do a half inch twice a week, that kind of thing. You definitely want to water your turf early in the morning, uh, you know, right before the sun comes up. That is the best time so you don't get a lot of evaporation from the water, um, you know, into the atmosphere and it all ends up in your turf. Uh, shrubs and trees, uh, we, we, you know, you're going to have to, especially newly planted things are definitely going to rely on you for some water for the first summer. I tend to water those things very heavily and then I let them dry out and I can't tell you how long that's going to be. I get this question for the last 30 years and it's, it's not, it can't be answered. It's all up to your soil type. Uh, it's up to um, the weather in your area, obviously how much rain you're getting. It's something that you need to check. You go down to the base of your plant, uh, dig a couple inches down and see if it's dry. And if it's dry, water it extremely well and then forget about it for a few days. You definitely don't want to, uh, to be watering and, and concentrating too much on watering shrubs and trees. They're pretty good on their own uh, without you. I get, uh, I've seen many, many plants that people told me, I don't know what happened, I watered it every day. And I go, I know what happened, you watered it every day. So just keep that in mind. Water them thoroughly and let them dry out. So I don't talk a lot about turf on this channel, but one mistake I see in so many yards uh, with turf is people are mowing too low. Uh, fescue uh, really needs to be mowed on the highest setting for your mower. Many, many mowers that you actually buy don't even go high enough uh, for where fescue should be mowed. You know, over three and a half inches, four inches. Uh, and that, it shades the ground uh, at that point, requires less water. If the sun gets down to the uh, soil level with fescue, it can just burn it off. Uh, during the summer, cause all kinds of problems. So if you have Bermuda or Zoysia or Centipede, any of the warm season grasses, uh, make sure you're checking uh, the, the height that's required or um, you know, the, the, the height that you should be mowing it at. And, and then I typically in the summertime will go a little bit higher than that, especially if I'm a person who's not irrigating. I'm not gonna irrigate my turf a whole lot. 
And then frequent mowing is extremely important. You don't want to ever cut you know, half the blade off at one time. So sometimes in the spring, especially in the month of May, this is the time of year you may it may require you mowing twice a week in order to not take more than a third of the blade off at the time. So in the Southeast United States, fall is actually the best time to plant uh, most uh, ornamental shrubs and trees. Uh, and the reason for that is the days are shorter, um, it's cooler out, they just don't require as much from us. Um, but the exception to that is ornamental grasses. I do not like to plant ornamental grasses in the fall. And most of my herbaceous perennials, things that go to sleep uh, in the winter and die completely back to the ground, I prefer to plant those in the spring as well. So if you're holding off on larger projects to the fall, do go ahead and do ornamental grasses, uh, any, like I say, herbaceous perennials, uh, anything that dies completely back to the ground, I think you'd be better off. Also, if you're planting things that are marginal in your area, that are barely cold hardy in your area. For me, uh, we can grow windmill palms in my area but I, don't, I would never fall plant it because if I planted it in the fall right before the winter, it'd be far more likely to be harmed. So if I spring plant it, it has an entire season to get rooted in and get established and prepare for that first winter. So uh, that's a lot of things uh, in this video. Um, thank you very much for following along with these monthly videos. I'll be back in June uh, with another one. Um, and like I say, I definitely have missed lots of things. May is the, one of the biggest gardening months of the year, obviously. And uh, if there's anything that I've obviously missed, um, add it to the comments below for people watching this video in the future. Thanks for watching.